Yes. Stanis, I'm going to ask you some questions about uh, loans at McFarland Trust. We've already touched on debt loans in association with debt, but um, first of all, did you have any role in formulating the policies at McFarland Trust on loans? No. The inquiry understands that the policies um, on loans, uh, i.e. what was available in terms of loans to registrants from the McFarland Trust, varied over the years. Were you aware at any given time what the policy was on loans? No, I knew that people had um, charges on their houses for various reasons. Um, presumably, um, you know, if they couldn't pay their mortgage and the charity had to help out there or other reasons. Um, and I believe at one point um, it was decided that if the loan was less than £10,000, that would just be done by an exchange of letters rather than by a charge on the property. But apart from that, I wasn't aware on, I wasn't involved in the formulation of any policy on loans. So that was just my understanding. So is this right that if, and we'll, we'll come and talk, I'll ask you some questions about the circumstances in which, in which you might be recommending that your client goes to the McFarland Trust to get a loan. But if you've got mm -hmm. to that stage, then you were really going to the McFarland Trust um, not knowing necessarily whether or not they would grant that loan because you didn't know necessarily what the, what the policies and guidelines were for granting loans. Uh, yes, I think once again each case was done on an on an individual basis. Um, were you? Did you get involved in uh, recommending to the McFarland Trust that loans should be made, uh, money should be advanced um, against regular payments? Th those sorts of loans. Is that something that you had any? dealings with no, I, from me, from memory I don't I, I don't think I did and so presumably you weren't did you know what the criteria you would you have known what the criteria for making such loans were no I, I, I wasn't uh, and equally um, you, you've said that you didn't know uh, whether what the policy would be on whether or not loans or grants should would were awarded to pay off debts but more generally, were you aware of any policy or guidelines from the McFarland Trust as to when they would give loans and when they would give grants? I think my understanding was that as, as a, if it was a large amount, it would, it, would, it would be a loan and possibly, you know, if it was something quite small, they might just give it as a grant. But I wasn't aware of anything that was, that was actually cast in stone. And did you have any role in determining whether loans should be granted to beneficiaries? Well, I think I, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, I visited people and I really considered the whole loan charge on house thing as a, as a last resort if there was no, nowhere else to go. So if I saw someone and I had to recommend it, I think I, I'd probably explored all the other options, such as um, getting the loan written off. Um, if it was mortgage related, trying to find another lender that might take on the loan at a, at a, at a rate of interest where the registrant um, would be would be in a, in a position to make the repayment. So as far as I was concerned, it was really the last thing. Um, in a series of things that I'd consider, and it was, you know, a way of keeping keeping somebody in their home, which was obviously very important. And why was it the last resort? Uh, well, in some cases, um, simply people just. Uh, I think this was more to do with widows. I wasn't involved all the case with all the cases where loans and property related um, loans were given. Um, but in one case I dealt with, um, it was a lady who just couldn't afford to pay her mortgage. Um, 
debts had been mounting up. She was with a lender who was a secondary lender, and by that I mean not someone like the Nationwide, a lender who lent to people who had a bad credit rating or had debt problems, and then that had come unstuck. So really there wasn't anywhere else to go. The only other option would have been for the lady to sell her home, pay back the mortgage and move into rented accommodation and she didn't didn't want to do that. So quite understandably she wanted to stay in her home. So my question was really why was it the last resort? Is that why was McFarland Trust seen by you as the last resort? Is it is it because equity share loans were disadvantage dis disadvantageous to clients because they effectively gave up equity in their property. Well, why, why wasn't it? A yes, but yeah, well, yes, I, I, I think, you know, if I could have got someone a normal, a normal mortgage um, and they didn't have to enter into, into an equity share arrangement, that would have been preferable. And did you explore with McFarland Trust whether or not they might offer either interest-free loans or, or loans secured on property attracting interest rather than equity share loans? I think by the time I'd arrived, even in 1991, the equity share loans were already in place. I think I did, um, obviously, loans attracting interest. Um, in a lot of cases, the registrants wouldn't have been able to pay them, so that would have just been a roll-up of, of interest, like a... a like an equity release, um, I think the what I was I was told whether it was by Tidder Williams or by Anne Hithersay was that the trustees saw the equity share was almost an investment for the for the charities um, and it didn't disadvantage the other registrants who didn't need this sort of support. I suppose in 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 fact, most of I, I don't know a simple a single case in my time with the charity, and I wasn't always there for the whole time uh, where any of these loans was repaid. What were you told about why the practice of granting equity share loans was stopped? What did you know about that? I didn't know anything about it. Maybe I wasn't around at the time. I didn't even know it was stopped. So so during the time that you were with the McFarland Trust, as far as you're aware, equity share loans were were, were an option in the, in the yes. circumstances you've yeah. outlined. Yeah, but I left the... I didn't work for the McFarland Trust after about... I can't remember whether it was 2006 or 2007, so I really don't know what happened after that. Were... Um, are you aware of were um, equity share loans or loans secured against property available in Scotland in so far as you were aware? I would think so, although I don't think I came across anyone in, in Scotland who, who had one, but maybe someone did. I, as I said, I didn't know every single equity share that, that the trust granted. I wasn't involved in, in every case. Who's really in the main only came to me when I visited people and they said, Oh, yes, McFarland Violent Trust and Equity Share on, on my house. So, in a lot of cases, um, the, the equity share was already there. Can I ask you to, um, can we turn up please, MACF 40223 underscore 017? So this is a letter dated uh, 10th of December 2004, Re Your Mortgage. And if we go over the page to, uh, to the second page, we can see that it's a letter written by you, um, CCing in Martin yeah. Harvey. And if we go back yeah. to the first page, you explain that you've been endeavouring to transfer the mortgage to a lender charging a lower yeah. rate of interest for some time. Um, mm. but unable to due to the poor credit writing rating. So is this an example of where... The this, was the, this was actually, just by coincidence, this was the case I was just talking to you about and so, explaining. So this is the, lo the last resort is 
uh, yeah. the, the arrangement. And that lender, on. Kensington Mortgages, they're still in operation and they're a lot better now. But at that time, they were really a lender of last resort, um, charging quite expensive interest rates because they lent to people who really had a poor credit rating and ha had had previous credit issues. And then you set out the various um, uh, terms and, and what's, what's to happen. Mm. And it's paragraph five that I wanted to ask you about. The trust will employ a solicitor yes. to act on their behalf, and I must advise you that you should obtain legal advice before completing any documents. You may care to show a copy of this letter to your solicitor. Now, what, what input would you have had after writing this letter to, uh, in terms of um, uh, knowing whether or not this uh, registrant had uh, obtained that legal advice? Um, I wouldn't have had any input, but the trust would have instructed whatever solicitors they were using at that time. The solicitors presumably would have had a copy of that letter and, and, and would have known that it was a condition um, that the registrant had independent legal advice. So that's how you understood this paragraph five, that it was a that's condition of the, of the agreement. Work. Going, going forward that there'll yes. be independent legal advice. Yeah. And I remember speaking to registrants and they, they did on occasion say to me, oh, I know I've got to get independent legal advice. So I think it was quite clear to them um, that that was what was supposed to happen. And, and hopefully the solicitors acting on behalf of the trust wouldn't have let the loan go through without ensuring um, that the registrant did have independent legal advice. And do you... I mean, that, that may be the case. But the actual wording of Clause 5 of this it isn't to make it a condition. It, it's expressed a strong advice, but it doesn't make it a condition of um, the loan, does it? In, well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a solicitor. I strongly advise people to get independent legal advice, and I hope that the solicitors acting on behalf of the, of the charity did that. But, um, Sir Brian, I've got no way of confirming now whether they did or whether they didn't. No, it, it would, I, I think, be pretty standard legal practice, at least as I understand it, at this yeah. time, uh, for someone advising the lender uh, to do their best to ensure that legal mm. advice had been given by a reputable source uh, to the borrower, uh, because otherwise uh, it might be said that there was uh, undue influence um, yes. in obtaining the, the loan. Uh, and so mm. for their own protection, they might regard it as important. But the, this, the way this is expressed in, in legal terms, um, it, it doesn't, I think, amount to what a lawyer would regard as a condition, which is something which must be fulfilled before uh, an event takes place. Correct. Well, as, as far uh, th as this I'm is aware, strong advice. They, yes, it's strong advice, and as far as I'm aware... Um, the trust lawyers um, were aware that 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 was one of the, okay. It wasn't a, a, what you're saying is it wasn't a condition, but it, that were aware that that that's what that was one of the things that that we advised. You um, r resigned from your role as. A uh, caseworker for, for the McFarland Trust in, in, is reported to the partnership group in, in, in June of 2006. Mm. Um, did you continue to um, act as an independent financial advisor after that date to McFarland Trust registrants? Um, yes, I think I, I think I did. If obviously the registrants. Um, could come to me independently so yes a lot of the registrants kept in touch with me and I, I helped them if necessary and do you, um, did you understand did you know anything about the arrangements made by the McFarland Trust after you left for um, financial advice to be given to registrants no no I didn't did you do you know anything about um, the arrangement McFarland Trust had with the Terence Higgins Trust to provide financial um, advice? 
No, one of the registrants may have told me that they were using the Terence Higgins Trust, but I wasn't aware of any of the um, circumstances surrounding that or what, what kind of advice was being provided. Uh, and so um, in terms of, so w when you were providing um, independent financial advice as an independent financial advisor to McFarland Trust registrants after having left uh, mm -hmm. McFarland Trust as a caseworker, were your fees paid by McFarland Trust in the usual way that they had been before you became the caseworker? Did that arrangement, did that arrangement persist? I can't, I can't remember. I can't remember whether once I left the McFarland Trust, if anybody wanted, wanted a mortgage or whatever, they still paid me. Sorry, I just, I just can't remember. You I said think what happened was that maybe the registrant applied for, if they could, they applied for a grant um, to cover the, the fee and... I think probably if they couldn't afford to pay me, I just went ahead and did the mortgage for them. You said you say in your statement that you um, resigned because you weren't getting um, support from the chief executive, who at the time was Martin Harvey. Can you just no, tell please. us a little bit more about about that and why you resigned from the McFarland Trust? Uh, well, as I as I said, I'd been working there for years, and uh, you know, it, and it became apparent that all of the um, all of the things that I did were suddenly being questioned yeah. after about when was that 1990 uh, 2006 so I'd already been working there since 1991 so it was about 15 years or so um, all of the things that I'd been doing for years with no queries whatsoever were questioned um, I used to get constant emails asking me why I'd done this, why I'd done that. Um, effectively, I felt I was being bullied. I didn't want to leave. I loved working with the registrants. So I loved the work I did, and I felt very, very sad um, that I was put in the position where I felt my only option was to leave because it was affecting me mentally. Yes, you say in your witness statement that it, it was the most rewarding job you've, you've done. It was. It was, absolutely. My time at the McFarland Trust and the Eileen Trust um, were, you know, just totally rewarding the registrants. I think in a way, I hope I supported them. I got far more back from them. They gave me far more support. At the time I um, resigned from the McFarland Trust, I know a number of reg registrants um, did some sort of petition to get me back, but obviously that was that was ignored so and what, I just felt that I had to move on and, and you say that the things that you've been doing for years were being queried what sort of things what, what sort of things were being queried well I think that just the help that I gave to gave to registrants was was being queried I don't think that um it made me popular um the two um statements that I made um, before that you read out before the break about the treatment of widows. I don't think that made me popular. Um, you know, I think the fact that I was prepared to stand up for things that I thought were wrong didn't really go down well. Uh, and was there a sense, in, was your way of working in that you, you, you wanted to visit registrants, spend time with them and so on, was that something that was queried? Um, no, I think I think most of the time the the trustees felt that the the visits were very beneficial. They were. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions now about the Eileen Trust. Yes. Um, how did you first become involved with the Eileen Trust? Uh, well. Peter Stevens asked me if I would review the files of the Eileen Trust because he felt that the Eileen Trust were a group that was, had largely been neglected. Um, I can't remember if it was at a time when the social worker, they had a social worker called Claudetta Allen and she was off for a long time. Um, so no one was carrying out that role. So I think 
work had, th had piled up and things had, had got, got behind. So Peter Stevens asked me if I would carry out a review. Um, so what I did, I went up to the office for a couple of days, um, got all the went through all the files for the Eileen Trust people, wrote to them asking if they'd like a visit or any help, um, and I got a very positive response. And so pr and prior to that, had you been providing any, in, um, uh, working with any of the Eileen Trust registrants as, a, as an independent financial advisor? Um, I think maybe the odd Eileen Trust person came up, but not, not many of them. You started uh, working as the caseworker in February 2005. Was that, yes. was that shortly after this review or around about that same time? It was around about the same time. Um, and so you, um, you've described how you have uh, carried out reviews of, of all of the uh, registrants at that time. Um, yes. What, what was your role as caseworker? Having carried out that re review, what was your role as caseworker? Uh, well, to come back to the trust, well, once I'd carried out the review, I obviously identified areas where the registrant concern needed help. So um, I would prepare reports and put some reports to the trustees. Um, we had regular trustee meetings where I'd prepare a list of cases and we'd go through every single case. Um, at the meeting. I think we had quarterly meetings and in between we just used to communicate by email and it all, all telephone or telephone and it worked very well. So the practice you've described, your practice that you've described to us this morning about how you visited registrants at the McFarland Trust, you would like to face to face visits, you would yeah. try and look at the whole circumstances of the yeah. Person or yes. the couple or the family that are in front of you was that the practice that you adopted at the Eileen Trust? Yes, I did. Um, uh, and you you say that you um, were, were you familiar with all of the registrants at the Eileen Trust? Yes, I think I think so. Or well, the ones that that were available for the files and the people, you know, as time went on, new registrants came on board. So yes as many as I could find. And were you able to meet all of those people? Yes. And yes. How, how regularly would you meet, meet with them or speak to them? Uh, well, I visited in the beginning, I visited the, tried to visit them all. I tried to visit them all at least once a year, if not more. We had the weekends where I saw every, every, everybody. Um, and just really quite regular telephone calls. Um, there was a lady, lovely lady, who's unfortunately no, no longer with us. She used to call me at least two or three times a week. Um, most people I probably spoke to, you know, at least once a month. So you had a pretty good picture of what was going on in, in, in all yes. of their lives? Yes, I did. Uh, and you have... Uh, describe the concerns that you had about the bureaucracy and the lack of compassion at the McFarland Trust. W what was the picture at the Eileen Trust? Totally different. I think I, I um, because it, well, I think one of the things was it was a much smaller organisation. Uh, there was just me and the trustees. Um, I encouraged the trustees to meet the registrants. Um, and I think because of that, uh, they they had a, a much better understanding of, of what, what the needs were of the registrants. And they actually spent time with them, um, the trustees, at the weekends. That I'd say that they, they formed a very good relationship with the registrants. I'm going to ask you some questions about um, the grants that were available, payments that were available from the yeah. Eileen Trust. Um, were regular payments made uh, by the Eileen Trust to, to, to infected beneficiaries and non-infectant dependent beneficiaries? They were paid to infected beneficiaries. Um, were they paid to non-infected beneficiaries? In some, ca in some cases, they were. There were payments made to children, 
Um, trying to think whether we had any. Yes, there were payments made to to widows or widowers as well. So, is this right that the constraints and the policies? that the McFarland Trust had to treat the infected community differently from the non-infected community, at least until um, ar until after the Archer um, uh, mm -hmm. reforms, describe them that way, um, were not applicable at the Eileen Trust. Is that...? Um, yes, I think so. I think the only constraint we had was that we had very little money. Um, in relation to... Uh, and, uh, um, single grants, they were available, were they, from the Eileen Trust? People could make applications yes, for yes, single they grants. Were. How in practice did that work? How, how were applications made? Were they made by individuals or did you put them forward on their behalf because of your knowledge of, the, uh, of their needs? How did it actually work? Um, well, if I went for a visit, if I visited someone or spoke to someone on the phone and um, it came up in the conversation that they needed something, um, I would put, put it forward. But people knew that if they had a problem, they could contact me and they did phone me and, 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 and request um, that I put, a, put, um, put, put it forward to the trustees um, that they needed a grant for whatever it was. So their first point of contact was you and you would yes. then, you would then um, facilitate the, 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 the yes. information going yes, to the trustees. And, yes, in terms of, and in terms of procedure, was there a set procedure that they had to have a certain amount of quotes if they wanted something or fill in an application form or something of that nature? Uh, well, if it, if it was... I, I did ask them to get a quote. Um, if it was the largest thing, I might have said, oh, get a couple of quotes. But I understood that, you know, they were real and, you know, it wasn't always easy to get quotes. So, you know, I took a view. If someone wanted to buy a washing machine and they would have asked me for £2,000, I would have said, oh, well, you need to find a less expensive washing machine. But I just took a, a reasoned view on what was appropriate for the particular item that they required. And... What, what test was applied um, to these applications by, by the trustees? We've heard um, evidence over the last few weeks from McFarland Trust witnesses that, that they were concerned with identifying charitable need, looking at financial need and sometimes, accept, sometimes applying the criteria of exceptional circumstances, determining whether somebody had... Um, disposable income that they could pay for the item themselves and so on. Um, what, what was the Eileen Trust's um, view on, on that? What, what test were they applying? I, I think it, 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 was broadly, it was broadly similar. Um, we did have a couple of registrants who were um, reason, reasonably well off or didn't need as much help and, and you know, help was proportioned to the people who um, had worse financial circumstances, people who had children, but we tried to be fair to everyone. And in terms of um, obtaining that information uh, so that that could be put before the board so they could understand what the financial situation was for the particular applicant in front of them, how was that done? Were people required to fill out income and expenditure forms or census forms, or did you have that information well, I, anyway? I've, 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 I visited them, and during that period, I, I, during that during the visits, uh, I look, looked at their income and expenditure. And were you? Did you have any authority from the trustees to award grants up to a certain amount? Or did it all was it all decision making the trustees? I've got, I've, I've, I've got a feeling that they allowed me, um, you know, something like if it was to up to about two hundred and fifty pounds. You know, normally I normally I would, I would do a, in between meetings I'd send around an email, so I'd always let them know what I was doing. But if it was a fairly trivial thing, I did have authority to authorise it. Trivial amount, I should say. And uh, is this correct that the Eileen Trust had uh, a copy of the McFarland Trust office guidelines, um, but the trust didn't agree to uh, use that as a guide rather than to be bound by them? Yes, yes, it was. It was a guide. Uh, and 
is it also right then that those guidelines wouldn't have been published or circulated to the beneficiaries, to the registrants? I'm not sure whether in the time I was there, I don't think a copy of the handbook was sent to the beneficiaries, but it may have been sent before my time. I, I, I'm not, not certain. How, how if, how if uh, guidelines about what, what grants that I trust might make um, weren't circulated, how, how did registrants know what they could apply for? They just contact. They contacted me, or I was in contact with them. So you. Would I think they must have had something at some point because uh, people knew that they could apply for help with things like hospital visits or works to the house, you know, central heating, things like that. So I, I, I think that something must have been sent at some point, maybe before my time. I can't remember specifically sending anything out because I was in such close contact with the registrants, but um, they were aware of certain things. So as I said, maybe something did go out at some point. Um, and did the Eileen Trust have areas where they would provide grants like um, boilers or hospital visits and areas where they wouldn't provide grants? Or was it more flexible? Or was it quite flexible? I think it was, it, 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 it was quite flexible. Then you um, became the secretary for the Eileen Trust on, in, in October 2011, is, is that right? Yes. Um, that was after Martin Harvey left that yes. role. Yes. Um, can, can we turn to um, EILN? Six zeros two underscore zero four four, please. So, in in that role, um, did you have to create budgets for the Eileen Trust? No. No. The only thing that that I did, which I hadn't previously done when I became secretary, was I took I took the minutes. That was the only, only difference it made to me. Can I, can I just ask you to look at this? Um, uh, it says financial and investment reports. And if you go over the page, it then says caseworkers report. And then if you go yeah. over to the next page, it says uh, requirements for future funding of the Eileen Trust based on analysis of the likely needs of the registrants, August 2012. Mm -hmm. And then you say... Um, difficult to gaze into the future with any certainty certain issues are obvious this report will cover the aging of the registrants and, and their spouses and often their main carers and it's far from clear that all the registrants who may be eligible to join the island trust have as yet been identified new registrants are still coming eight since the turn of the century and two cases under consideration and then you go on to talk about aging of the registrants and then as we go through the report if you just go down to the bottom of the page um you, you seem to be going through and identifying each of the registrants and what their potential yes. needs could be. Yes. And if we go to the end, um, to the last penultimate um, page of this um, document, uh, the one before that, please. It says, it's difficult to provide an exact estimate of costs, but these costs have been broken down into three categories. Younger residents whose condition was diagnosed early and are coping as best they can, middle-aged reg reg registrants who need additional help, and older registrants who, in the writer's opinion, are the sector who will require the most help now and over the coming years. Let's assume that provision should be made for the deaths of two out of the five beneficiaries whose life expectancy now appears to be quite limited. And then you say the figures below include winter fuel payments, an estimated cost of two funerals, annual ET event, costs associated with potential new registrants. And then you talk about movement of registrants between categories. And then if we go over to the next page, um, estimates, difficulties of forecasting explained. Figures would appear to be in the order of potential capital cost in the next 12 months of £51,000 and an ongoing annual cost of £100,000 as laid out above um, and yes. announces there. Uh, the capital cost presumably is in relation to the new registrants, is it? 
Uh, yes, and things that we knew that we 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 would have to pay for. Um, and yes, then, but probably re in relation to the new registrants. And then you set out the annual co annual cost um, going forward for to meet the needs of all of the registrants that you've just yes. been through and, and, and assessed. Was that something yes. that you did as caseworker before you were secretary on an annual basis then? What, providing, the, the, doing the, reports like this? Yes, the budget, effectively saying to the trustees that this is how much money we're going to need for the next 12 months. Uh, well, from time to time, the chairman, Peter Stevens, would ask me um, to do reports like this. So when he was going to go back to the Department of Health and ask for an annual allocation, um, he could show them on what basis he, he was asking for the funds. So, so it, it was. It wasn't an annual. It wasn't an annual. It wasn't part of your role. It to wasn't do cast that. in stone, but I think I probably did do it. Quite a fair, I probably did do it on on a on an annual basis because I always carried out um, reports as to what the likely needs were of the registrants. So maybe it wasn't quite set in those terms, but. I usually had a good idea of what, what the registrants might need. Obviously, there were unforeseen circumstances, and it was difficult to know um, if new registrants came on board, what their needs might be. But you, because of your knowledge of the registrants, you could do it with some specificity? Yes, 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 I could. Um, Shivit, you can take that document down. Um, what was the Eileen Trust policy and attitude to paying off registrants' debts? I think um, I think we really only had one very bad de debt case um, from memory. There may have been more. And that was because a registrant had lost, whether he had come to the trust late or whether he had lost contact with the trust um, I'm not sure but he was given a lot of help he had a lot of debts due to no fault of his own and he was given a lot of I got managed to get a lot of his debts written off but I think the trustees in that case did decide to um, pay some of some of the debts off. So is it fair to say they they're, they're couldn't really be a policy because there was only one case. Uh, that's right. There probably were a few other cases, but it wasn't like there were lots and lots of cases, so we could look at them on, a, on an individual basis. Uh, and did the Eileen Trust offer loans to registrants? I don't think we ever gave anyone a loan. I think my primary concern um, when I first started reviewing the registrants was to get their finances sorted out um, as much as I could do and put them on a firm financial footing. So I don't think there was a need to give them loans. Uh, when it became clear that the Eileen Trust was going to um, be shut down, um, mm -hmm. is this right? A, d a decision was made to distribute the reserves uh, amongst the beneficiary, amongst the registrants, yes. before closing down? Yes, yes correct. What, what, can you explain how that was carried out and what your role was in that? Uh, well, as, as I've previously, previously stated, I did have a very good knowledge of the circumstances of the beneficiaries anyway, but in view of that, um, further inquiries were carried out with the beneficiaries um, and they were dis the the reserves were distributed on the on the basis of need, and um, you know, the people with the highest need got got the most, and gradually down the scale. Uh, and were all the beneficiary were, were were all the reserves distributed in that way? Uh, yes, yes. Well, I think the um, tr trust kept back about five thousand pounds to pay for any unform unforeseen expenses that might have uh, come up such as you know unforeseen legal fees or accountancy fees you've, you've um, told us you've mentioned on several occasions the 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 events at the Eileen Trust H yes. how frequently were there Eileen Trust weekends uh, every year 
once a year. Uh, and were there other events? No, that was the main event. Um, from time to time, um, apart from my meetings with them, I think on one occasion, Peter Stevens came to see a registrant with me on a particularly um, difficult case where there was a, a, a mother and three children and she was in very poor health and likely to, um, you know, she, she did actually die and leave the three children. So I wanted... Um, a bit of back up there I thought it was important that he came, came to meet with the lady but no it was really the the the, the weekend event um, we heard evidence the inquiry heard evidence from Peter Stevens that you gave assistance to individuals who wanted to apply to the Department of Health for a capital payment as a result of uh, being infected from blood and blood products and that yes. you you assisted them before they had made that application to obtain the relevant evidence um, to put before the Department of Health. Is, is that right? Yes, I tried. I, I tried, yes. Do, do you know what... Um, uh, evidence the Department of Health required um, in order to accept somebody um, as uh, uh, no, eligible? No, I, do, I don't think they did either, and I think they made it as difficult as possible for the person to actually apply. Um, I really didn't feel that that was, that was my role, nor did I feel that I, I had the medical qualification to do it, but there was no one else to do it, and I didn't feel it was right to leave these poor people struggling on their own. So I tried to gather as much evidence as possible. Um, it was very hard. A lot of some of the hospitals where the registrants thought they had their blood transfusion were no longer there. The records were either destroyed or it was it was it was very difficult and you know on a few cases I was successful in getting it through it took me quite a long time probably between a year and 18 months um but some cases it was just impossible impossible to prove it the proof had probably probably been you know wasn't was no longer there if it, if indeed it, it existed in the first place Do you do do you feel that do, do you think that the um, Ironing Trust was successful in in meeting the registrants' needs? Yes, yes, I, I do largely. Obviously, if we would have had more money, we could we could have done a lot more. But I think that we we tried to help them as best as we as we could. Um, we we were there for them and we showed compassion. And they knew that they could talk to us. Um, the answer to this is probably obvious, given what you've told us this morning. But do, do you think that the Eileen Trust was more successful at doing that than the, than the, than the McFarland Trust was? Yes. Uh, and why do you think that was? Well, I suppose that you could say it was because it was a much smaller group of people. Um, I don't think there was the same level... In, not in all in, in all cases. In some cases, there wasn't the same level as anger with the Eileen Trust registrants as there were with the McFarland Trust registrants. Um, I generally think that the Eileen Trust registrants um, were treated better, and they didn't have to go s through such a form of bu bureaucracy um, to apply for anything. So those were the questions that I had from Daniels. Um, 
I yes, don't know whether well, now would be a good time to take an early lunch break or... Well, you, you, you want to pick up the questions from, from those who, who uh, may have them. Yes. So uh, shall, we, uh, shall we take an early lunch because otherwise you, there won't be enough time before uh, the usual lunch break um, and come back at quarter to, to one. Uh, to two, <laughs> sorry, quarter to two. Yes, sir. Thank yep. you very much. Thank you.